Our text will be Ephesians chapter number 6, verses 10 to 14. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 14. When you find your place, would you stand and we'll give honor to the word of God. Bible says, beginning in verse number 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would speak to our hearts through your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower and anoint the words that go out. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd help me to have recall of the things that you've put on my heart this week, and I pray that you'd give us all receptive hearts to hear the word of God and receive it Uh, Lord, as we're supposed to. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I was reading a story recently about a young boy that went outside in the springtime and he found a caterpillar and he brought it home as a pet. How many of you moms have had uh, unusual pets brought into your house at one point or another? Miss Geneva, you kind of look like you've been down that road a few times. I think every little boy at some point or another finds a caterpillar and puts it in a mason jar. And that's what this child did. He, he brought the caterpillar home. He put it in a, a jar with a small stick and some leaves. And then he watched for a few days as this caterpillar began to build its cocoon. And after several days in the cocoon, the boy noticed one day that there's a tiny little hole uh, that had appeared overnight in the cocoon. And it looked like the caterpillar was kind of struggling to get out. Well, this child didn't know much about biology at this point in his life, and he thought, well, there's no way. I saw how big that caterpillar was that made that cocoon. He said, there's just no way that that big caterpillar is going to make it out of that cocoon through that tiny little hole. And so he went and got some scissors, and he reached in there with the scissors, and he cut the cocoon and made the hole a little bigger. It wasn't very long. The caterpillar comes out, but it's got a, uh, it's a butterfly at this point, but it's got an oversized body and smaller, weak wings that really wouldn't work. And as you might expect, it wasn't long until this caterpillar died. Uh, What he didn't understand was the struggle was necessary for that caterpillar to build the strength to survive. Uh, As those caterpillars come through those tiny little holes, there's a fluid in their body that's pushed into their wings. As they force themselves through those little holes, that fluid is forced into their wings, and it makes their wings strong and it gives them the ability uh, to fly. And without a struggle, the butterfly never flies, and it never fulfills its purpose in life. And the struggle of breaking out is what strengthens it for the challenges uh, that lie ahead. This is a metaphor. In addition to a real story, it's a metaphor for the Christian life. Uh, Bible believers, we encounter struggles in life, don't we, church? We encounter difficulties and, and, and problems. And this illustration from the animal kingdom serves as a lesson to us this evening. Now, we don't want to struggle. Uh, We don't like to struggle. Uh, In fact, as parents, oftentimes we look into the lives of our children, uh, usually young adult children, we see that there's not a big enough hole in the cocoon, and what do we do for them? We go get the scissors, and we make the hole bigger. We don't like to see our kids struggle, do we, church? Those of you that are old enough to have children that are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, we try to help them out as much as we can, and I don't think it's always wrong to help your kids, Uh, but I do think you can go overboard with that. Anybody know someone that went overboard on helping out their kids? Uh, It doesn't prepare them for the rest of their life, does it? Uh, You got to let them go through some of the pain and some of the struggles, as difficult as that is to watch, and as hard as it is to stand back and keep your hands off the situation, uh, we got to let them go through some struggles in life so that they grow the wings necessary uh, for the remaining challenges. So we don't like to struggle, we don't want to struggle, but the struggle is critical to our growth and development as believers. Let me give you another example of this principle. It's found in history. How many of you remember that the generation of Americans that survived World War II is oftentimes referred to as the greatest generation? Uh, That generation of people 
are known for their hard work. They're known for their perseverance. They're known for their stick to itness. And, and boy, that was, in fact, the greatest generation. But have you noticed uh, down through the time of history since the, the, the World War II generation, with each passing generation, we're getting softer and softer and softer. Each generation expects more help than the generation before God. And, and look at what America is producing today. Uh, I'm kind of saddened by what's coming out of our colleges, aren't you? In fact, universities and colleges are now having safe spaces built on their campuses where kids can go and cry and express their feelings. Uh, back when World War II was unfolding, 16 and 17 year old boys were going off to combat and they were lining up to do it. I've met two people in the recent past that told me they went to the recruiter's office and lied about their age so they could join the service and go defend their country in World War II. And yet today's generation, they're, they're sitting somewhere crying about being offended over this or over that. They've gotten their feelings hurt over. People get offended over everything these days, don't they, church? Instead of struggling, we want help. We want ease and comfort. Uh, we avoid any form of struggle, and that includes spiritual struggles. We don't like to struggle spiritually any more than we like to, to struggle financially or, or physically or materially. We don't need more help. We need more struggle. Now, that sounds like a crazy thought, doesn't it? You thought maybe coming here tonight, you read the bulletin, The Struggle is Real, is the title of the lesson. You thought maybe I was going to tell you, hey, just let, jump up on God's lap and let him burp you and take all your struggles away. Well, I got news for you tonight, church. That's not going to happen. In fact, God wants you to have some struggles. He knows that you need some struggles. We don't need more help. We need more struggle. We would be better equipped to serve the Lord if we struggled more. One of the reasons why folks can't serve Jesus is because they've never struggled spiritually. They've never gotten out on the end of the limb and had to get a hold of God like they've never gotten a hold of him before. Too much help and too little struggling has turned us into weak, uh, uh, anemic Christians. The believer who never struggles will always be weak, will always be immature in their faith. So let's take a few moments tonight, real quickly. I'm going to be short. You've heard that one before, haven't you? Yeah, usually when you hear that, it means we're going to be here a while. Uh, I'm teasing. We're going to be short tonight, but let me give you just a few thoughts on this principle of struggling in the Christian life. And I begin with the reality of struggling. Life is filled with struggles, isn't it, church? Life is filled with struggles, isn't it? Church? Hey, we got to get excited about preaching, all right? Uh, I, I don't expect this to be a preacher's conference. I was watching a preacher's conference the other day. There was about six guys on the front row standing on the pew, waving their Bibles back and forth, shouting amen. Mike, if you do that, I'll give you $10. How's that? Right, Fred, pay the man, would you? Fred reached for his Bible. He was going to stand up back there. He, he make $10. He's still got 90 to go before next week to get that $100 in that box. All right, life is filled with struggles. It's a certified reality. I don't have to preach that too hard. You know what I'm talking about. You've had struggles before. But let me say this. Nothing worthwhile in this life comes easy. Nothing in this life worthwhile comes easy. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we live in a time where everybody wants a handout. Uh, the government's ruining Americans. Uh, in fact, you can't find anybody to take a job. They make more money staying home. I was just talking to somebody this week where they work. There's all sorts of jobs available. Nobody will take the jobs because everybody makes more money staying home these days. Nothing worthwhile in this life comes in the mailbox. You've got to get out and work for it. You've got to struggle for it. You've got to put in some sweat equity, okay? That principle is never more true than in the spirit realm. Once we got outside the Garden of Eden, life was no picnic after that, all right? It's not the slice of heaven that the Garden of Eden was. It's filled with struggles. Life is filled with struggles. Life is filled with toil. In fact, that's why God told Adam that he had to subdue the ground by the sweat of his brow in Genesis 3.19. Uh, before the fall of man, gardening was probably really easy. Uh, he probably just spit the, water, the watermelon seeds, Brother Reno. Adam probably just sat back in his chase lounge and spit the watermelon seeds, and the next day there was a great plant there with watermelons on it. But after the fall of man, that wasn't the case, was it? God said, now you've got to farm. And if you've ever farmed before, you know that's hard work. Donovan, it's hard work getting up at 4 in the morning and getting out there and milking the cows and doing all the other things that you got to do. By the way, this generation don't like that. Not everybody in this generation. I'm speaking generally, of course. There are some people that are willing to work hard. But for the most part, our generation has become a soft generation. 
Uh, God told Adam that he was going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. Why? Because God knows that struggling strengthens us to survive the assaults that we encounter this side of heaven. I think of the birth process. Dr. Bean told us the other day she's helped uh, deliver over a thousand babies. That's got to be a record somewhere. A thousand babies, that's a lot. The birth process is a struggle. Uh, for none of the ladies in this room that's given birth, was it easy? That's a struggle, isn't it, church? It's a struggle for mama. It's a struggle for the baby. Learning how to walk, that's a struggle. How many times do the little ones fall and bump their head before they learn how to walk? They don't just jump up and take off, do they? Uh, they it, it's a struggle. Learning how to talk is a struggle. I'm still working on that one. It's a struggle. Learning how to feed ourselves is a struggle. I'm not struggling with that one. I've got that one nailed, all right? But every one of those struggles that we go through prepares us for the next phase or the next level of life. And without that struggle, we're ill-prepared for what lies ahead. I was reading this week, Brother Jim, about some of the animals that are born. Boy, the animal kingdom is fascinating, isn't it? There are so many illustrations of God's Word in the animal kingdom. God's Word is confirmed by and affirmed by so many different things that we see in nature and in the animal kingdom in particular. There are some animals that are born completely self-sufficient. They're born and boy, they take off, they're ready to go. There's not any learning or whatever that takes place. They're just ready to go, they're self-sufficient. Uh, the sand tiger shark is one of the animals like that. Other animals develop self-sufficiency very quickly. Uh, those of you that have cattle know that when that calf is born, it doesn't stay on the ground long, does it? Uh, I, I don't know for sure, Brother Mike, how long do your calves stay on the ground when they're born? Not very long, a couple of hours maybe, maybe an hour, and they're up and they're walking. Uh, none of the ladies in this room had a baby that was up and walking an hour later, right? It just doesn't happen. Some of the animals are self-sufficient. Uh, immediately, some of them get there pretty quickly, but human beings have to struggle for months or years to develop, all right? The struggle, though, is critical to our maturity. We need to go through that. So we see the reality of struggling, but second, I want you to see the refusal of struggling. Our problem is that we don't like this idea of struggling. We demand a struggle-free, no cost, no hassle, immediate satisfaction life. We want everything and we want it right now without having to work for it or labor for it or struggle for it or fight for it. Just gimme, gimme, gimme right now. And we want spiritual maturity like that as well, without any struggle, without any uh, a work, without any labor, without any effort. We want a great marriage. We want a great home. We want great kids, all without a struggle. We want a vibrant prayer life. We want to learn God's word. We want to memorize scripture. We want to witness to everybody and win them to the Lord. But we want all of that and everything else that God has to offer. But we want it now, and we don't want to have to pay for it. We don't want to have to put any effort in. We don't want to have to do any work. In fact, we do everything in our power to prevent struggling of any kind. We are so opposed to struggle that God has to struggle with us to get us to get anything out of us. I, I think of how soul winners struggle and beg people to get saved. Oh, it breaks my heart when we go out, Donovan, and you talk to people and you just plead with them to get saved. And yet they're not interested. And then after you do have somebody saved, pastors and Sunday school teachers have to struggle with believers to get them to attend church and to get baptized and to join the church and serve the Lord. Can I say this tonight? If you really got saved, no pastor needs to be begging you to get in church. It's just that simple. If you're really saved tonight, no pastor should have to beg you to serve the Lord. No Sunday school teacher should have to come to your house every week and knock on your door and say, it's me again, are you going to be there tonight? I'm not talking about children. We expect that out of children. I'm talking about full-grown adults. It shouldn't be that hard. But we don't like that struggle. We, we avoid that struggle. Parents and pastors and teachers plead with Christians to be faithful and obedient to the Word of God and to do the things that God's called us to do. You know, sometimes church members wonder, why is a preacher always acting like a drill sergeant? It's because so many people refuse to embrace the struggle and be what God has called them to be. Hey, I get it. Coming to church on Sunday night and Wednesday night, it's not easy. Uh, we're all tired. You know, I hear people say to me all the time, preacher, I'm tired. Guess what? I'm tired too. One of these days, I'm going to start telling people what I'm really thinking. I remember when my father-in-law, Brother Reno, he got to an age where the filter just went away. And he even told me, he said, Mike, I'm too old to worry about what people think about me. I'm going to tell them the truth, whether they want to hear it or not. And I thought, I can't wait until I get to that age. I don't know that I'm yet, but I'm starting to get close. You know, people say, oh, I'd come, but I'm tired. Guess what? We're all tired. Quit whining. 
We're all, we're all weary. We've all got to get up and go to work on Monday. We've all got things going on in our lives. We just, we just don't like the struggle. And, and that's why preachers and others have to beg us sometimes to do what God wants us to do. I, you know, I feel like sometimes I'm a nursemaid, kind of getting, begging people, come on, come on, come on. First time you take your eyes off of them, they're out again, and you've got to go find them and beg them back again. Newsflash, spiritual maturity was not meant to be easy. Coming to church is hard. Coming to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, it is difficult. Giving is difficult. Tithing is difficult. Giving to missions, it's difficult. Witnessing is difficult. Getting up early in the morning and praying, difficult. Reading your Bible, difficult. Studying the scripture, difficult. It's all difficult, okay? But we need that struggle. It wasn't ever meant to be easy. And if you refuse to struggle, you're always going to be weak and anemic spiritually and fail to reach your potential. The key to spiritual growth and this is interesting, but this is true. The key to spiritual growth is to take on more responsibility until it becomes a struggle. Now, wait a minute, preacher. I, I, I've just got all my, my assignments down, and I, I'm working through them, and everything's going smoothly, and now you want me to take on more to the point where I struggle? That's exactly what I'm saying. Do more. Give more. Be more until it becomes a struggle. If you're able to serve the Lord at the level that you're serving the Lord at, and it's not a struggle, you need to do more. God wants you to struggle. Boy, I'm getting a lot of amens tonight on that. If you're serving the Lord and there's no struggle, there's no pain, there's no challenge, there's no difficulty involved, then guess what? Get out of bed and do more for God. Get up in the morning, bright and early, by the way, put your clothes on, get in your prayer closet, open your Bible, and start doing more for Jesus. Give until it becomes a struggle. Serve until it becomes a struggle. Pray until it becomes a struggle. Live for Jesus until it becomes a struggle. Why? Because we need the struggle. We avoid the struggle. We run from the struggle. But God says you need the struggle. Why? Because the struggle makes you stronger. When you force yourself through that little hole, that, 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 that fluid goes into your wings and you have the ability to take flight and soar for Jesus. The key to spiritual growth is to take on more responsibility until it becomes a struggle. Serving the Lord is designed to be inconvenient. It makes men out of boys, and I guess I should say ladies out of girls. Not struggling does the opposite. Not struggling makes boys out of men. One of the reasons why we have folks in our church that aren't serving the Lord at anywhere near their potential is because they have run from the struggle. You found a comfort zone. You found a plateau where you fit in and, and you didn't get challenged anymore and, and you were comfortable there. Guess what? You need to do more. You need to give more. You need to pray more. Whatever we're talking about, you need to do more of it. You need some struggle. Here's a thought. Examine your own spiritual life. And if you find that there's no struggle in your current spiritual life, you're not doing enough. Church attendance, if it's not convenient, you're not going enough. Boy, howdy, it's getting quiet around here now. If it's not a struggle, you're not doing enough. I, I was talking to, uh, not too long ago, I was talking to a preacher friend of my father-in-law's. They've been friends since their early 20s. In fact, this man played a, a major role in my father-in-law getting saved. They both went off to, to Baptist Bible College together. They've both pastored. My, my father-in-law pastored until he went home to be with the Lord. This man is still alive and just in the last few years finally came out of the pulpit. He's uh, approaching 90 years old right now and he's, he's struggling with his health. But boy, he, he gets on Facebook and he writes a sermon every day on Facebook. And he tells people on the sermon on Facebook, I don't have a pulpit anymore, so this is my pulpit. I'm going to put it on here, and then you take it and preach it, all right? And so 15 of the messages you've heard in the last two months are his messages. I'm just teasing. It was only 13 of them, okay? Only 13. But he tells the story of how way back in the day, they were pastoring a smaller country church. I think it was in Illinois. And uh, they didn't have anybody to help clean the building. And so he'd take his family, his wife and his kids, on Saturday evening about 6 o'clock, and they'd, uh, they'd eat dinner, and then they'd head off to the church, and they'd clean the church all evening. And because it was a drive and because they didn't have enough money to go back and forth as frequently as we do today, they would all sleep on a pew in the church building so that they could be there bright and early on Sunday morning. Hey, don't tell me that coming on Sunday night and Wednesday night is too inconvenient. We've gotten soft in our generation, amen? Anybody here ever slept on the pew all night Saturday night so you weren't late on Sunday morning? Then we got to quit whining, don't we? we got to quit saying it's so hard, it's so difficult, it's so inconvenient. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 11.
Let's look for just a moment in Hebrews chapter 11. You already know where I'm going with all this, don't you? Think of the struggles that were faced by the first century believers. And then think of the results that they experienced as a result of that. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse number 13. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in the fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and in the mountains and in the dens and the caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Please don't tell me that our lives is a struggle. When's the last time anybody in this church was put in an empty log and sawn asunder? When's the last time anyone in Crawford County was burned at the stake for serving the Lord? Somebody say amen right there. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being real tonight. i got to call it like I see it, church. Uh, our struggles are, uh, uh, are, are so minimal. They're, they're almost non-existent compared to what we read in Hebrews chapter 11 about the first century Christian. And our struggle-free life of comfort is producing wimps instead of warriors. We pray for God's blessings on our life. Everybody in this room has prayed that. Uh, no one any more than me. We pray for God's blessing on our lives. I'm going to get out on the end of the limb and tell you something tonight. We don't need any more of God's blessing. We've got more than we need right now. We have too many blessings as it is. We need to be, that's why we're in this predicament. We need more struggles. Perhaps what we ought to do on Wednesday night, instead of praying for God to bless uh, our church family, God give us more of a struggle. God make it a little more. Hey, by the way, we better get ready for what's coming. Uh, I just saw the video this afternoon on YouTube of the church in, in uh, Elmer, Ontario, Canada, where the police showed up. I believe it was this morning. The pastor's already been arrested. He was released from jail because they wouldn't stop having church. There's a, a, a COVID order out. Uh, they wouldn't stop having church, and he's already been arrested. Today they showed up. I think it was today. It was, I saw the video today. The, the, the police showed up and shut the church down. Talk about powerful. The church was standing, the uh, room was filled, the, the folks were standing and singing at the top of their voice, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, while the county sheriff and, and police department marched in to evict them and locked their doors. They brought a locksmith with them, kicked them all out and changed the locks on their church door. Hey, it's coming. It's coming. In fact, it's already here. And if we're going to be ready for that, we need to experience some struggles. You know, when that wave of persecution, when that first wave hits the beach, a number of people who call themselves Christians are going to take off running. And they're going to abandon their Christianity. We need more struggles. If we struggled more, we'd grow more. We'd do more. So quit looking for ways out of the struggle and look for ways to struggle more. Here's an idea. Pick a fight with the devil. Come to the altar tonight at the end of this message and make a commitment to the Lord Jesus that you are going to increase in your service for him. You talk about picking a fight with Satan, that'll do it. Satan never lets a believer make a decision that he doesn't fight. You make any decision for Jesus that he calls you to make, and I assure you, Satan is going to fight the decision. So how do you pick a fight with the devil? You come to the altar, you kneel down, and you say, or you say Lord, uh, the preacher uh, preached this message, and, and I think I need to increase my, my commitment. I think I need to do more for the Lord. I think I need to get out there and fight more and do more. And I guarantee you, Satan's going to fight that. Amen? If you'll do that, the fight will be on, and then you'll have some struggles. You're thinking, ain't no way I'm going to do that. Ain't no way I'm going to ask for more struggles. That's why we're in the position that we're in. Sitting in the pew and enduring church for an hour isn't picking a fight with the devil. That's asking for a struggle-free Christian existence. Struggling or not struggling has made you what you are today. 
person that you are tonight, seated in that pew, how much or how little you've struggled. Have you ever noticed that all the crisis management occupations demand that their people undergo training? If you're in the military, what's the first thing they do to you? They send you to basic training. If you join the police department or the sheriff's department, what's the first thing they do to you? They send you off to basic training. They send you off to the police academy. If you want to be a firefighter, they have a fire academy. If you want to be an EMT, they have some basic training for that. Our doctors, they go through a, a, a thing they call residency, all right? They're purposely exposed to tremendous stress and struggle to prepare them for the challenges that they're going to face on the job. I don't know about you. I don't want to go to a doctor that's a wimpy person that's never had to face anything difficult. I, I, want, them to, I want them to examine me and say, I've seen this before. I've worked through this situation before. I've helped somebody else with this difficulty for before. I don't, I don't want a military that's not been to basic training where they start picking up rocks and throwing them at the enemy. Go away. Go away. I don't want that. Hey, I, I want a soldier that knows how to carry a rifle on his shoulder, knows how to dodge bullets and, and, and put a tourniquet on a wound and fight back. That's what I want. I, I want police officers, when I need a policeman, I want somebody to show up that's got some grit, that's been through some battles, that knows how to hit, that's got a command presence about him or herself. I, I don't want a police officer that's going to show up and say, well, let's just see how we can work this thing out. That doesn't work on the streets very well. Let me help you with that, okay? You get run over with that kind of a mentality. you got to have a command presence on the street. you got to have some grit in you, all right? I, 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 that's why they send these folks to those situations. They've got to experience some stress and some struggle so that they can grow and be prepared for the job and for all the challenges that they're going to face. A believer who never goes through basic training will never be all that God intends them to be. And if you're a weak believer tonight, it might be because you've never struggled before, okay? And if you're a spiritual weakling, it's time to encounter some struggles. You don't want that. You don't like to hear that, but it's what you need. How many of you know what it's like to be a bodybuilder? Talk to Mike Bean. He'll tell you all about that. Mike Bean knows what it's like to be a bodybuilder. I don't know who that was that laughed at you, Mike, but I'd go slap him around after church if I were you. What happens when a bodybuilder can comfortably lift a certain weight? Brother Reno, when a bodybuilder is able to get down on that bench and put 200 pounds on the bar and lift it without any difficulty, what does he or she do? They add more weight. If you don't add any weight, you're going to plateau, and you're not going to build any more muscle, and you're not going to accomplish your goals as a bodybuilder. When you get to a certain weight where you're comfortable, you got to put more weight on the bar, okay? He does that so that he becomes uncomfortable again. And when he becomes uncomfortable, then he grows stronger as a result of that. We have become too comfortable in the Christian life, and we need to put another weight on the bar. If you're not happy with the person that you are tonight, add another weight to the bar. If you're not happy with the level of, 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 of service to the Lord that you're rendering, add another weight to the bar. If you're not happy with your prayer life, if you're not happy with your Bible study, if you're not happy with your missions giving, if you're not happy uh, uh, in your witnessing, add another weight to the bar. Otherwise, you're going to plateau, and every bodybuilder will tell you, once you plateau, if you don't change that, if you don't make arrange, adjustments, rather, you're going to start declining, okay? So increase the struggle because the struggle strengthens. Take charge and stop letting your demand for comfort dictate the terms of your life. Christians defeat themselves by remaining in their comfort zone. How many times have we heard recently the, the phrase, snowflake? Well, we like to use that phrase as long as we're talking about somebody else, right? This group or that group, they're all the snowflakes. But I, I'm afraid that, that much of Christianity, we've become spiritual snowflakes. We just don't want, we don't want any difficulty. Well, I'd witness to him, but he'd, he'd look at me and say, boo. So I can't witness to him. because I don't want him to say boo to me. We, I can't go knock on that door. What, what, what could happen to me if I knocked on that door? We need to have some struggles in our lives so that we're not spiritual snowflakes. When struggling is avoided, we grow weaker. There's the reality and the refusal. And then finally, and we're done, the rewards of struggling. When you do all that you can to avoid struggling, you're actually just cheating yourself out of God's best for your life. You're not cheating anyone else. You're cheating 
yourself out of God's best for your life. And I believe that many believers are living spiritually defeated lives tonight because they've demanded a struggle-free existence. But obtaining spiritual maturity is not God's responsibility. Does God want you to grow spiritually? Absolutely. Has he given you every resource necessary? Absolutely. Did Jesus die on the cross so that you could be saved and grow spiritually? Absolutely. But God will not do that for us. He wants you to be mature. He wants you to serve him, but you have to make the choice to do it. Amen or oh me? God will not force you to sit in front of an open Bible and read it every day. You got to make that decision on your own, okay? Great men seldom come from a life of ease and comfort. How often do we see men achieve greatness through struggle? We see men or women, they'll struggle and they'll work and they'll toil and they'll labor and their businesses and their endeavors will grow stronger and stronger and they'll amass great wealth and great success and great security. And because it was so hard on them and because they had to endure so much to get there, they want to take care of their children. And so they give their children a lot of their money. They, they pass their wealth on. And, and what do we see sometimes in those families? We see a bunch of spoiled brats. Some of those kids on TV and online, rich parents, successful parents, labored night and day to build their business, to build their occupation, to build their career. They gave a lot of it to their kids. Their kids didn't work for it. They just took and took and took. And now they're big babies is what they are. They're on some reality TV show whining and crying because they had to settle for an iPhone 12 instead of getting an iPhone 13. And we laugh at that and we think that's funny, but the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. Compare the youth of today with the pioneer generation. You know what? People aren't any different than they were 100 years ago. We're not made any different. Our DNA is not any different. Our, we don't have less muscle than they had 100 years ago. The, the pioneer generation, those folks just had to live through struggles. How many of you all went through the Depression? A couple folks here went through the Depression. Miss Patty, you didn't go through the Depression. You may have depression, but you didn't go through the depression. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to have a session for lying over here. <laughs> well, you did have 11 kids in your family, so it probably was like the depression. Yeah. You know, if you've, if you've ever been around somebody that lived through the depression, well, they got some grit and some character to them. They hard, they're hard workers, Donovan. They, they're not wasteful people. A, a lot of the older folks that are hoarders today, and sometimes we have fun with them and, 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 and jab at them a little bit, well, they're hoarders because they didn't have a thing when they were a kid. And they didn't throw nothing away. Uh, if, if you got some little sliver of meat, you ate it. It didn't matter what part of the animal it came from, you ate it. All right? Uh, they, they didn't throw things away because they never had anything. It's just a different time today, isn't it? And we're not any different. Our DNA is not one bit different than the pioneer generation. They were not bigger, stronger, and faster than we are. We're, we're all exactly the same. The difference is they took on the struggle, and we don't want to. There are kids today that won't even spend the night in a Motel 6. I said, you got to be kidding me, a Motel 6? I've never stayed in anything less than a five-star hotel. And we laugh, but Christians can be just the same way. I was telling you that I was listening to Brother Van Wy talk not too long ago, and, and he was talking about how he and, and my father-in-law went off to Bible college. You know, in those days, a lot of the men in Bible college, today it's, it's more, you know, the kids that are graduating from high school, kids that are Jill and, and Jack's age, they go into college. But, but back in the day, a, lo a lot of the men that went off to Bible college were actually already married men. In fact, a lot of them had been to, uh, to, to the military already. Brother Reno, were you in the military before you went to Bible college or after? So, and you, you had a wife and children already, right? And that was not uncommon back in that day. But when you go to Bible college and you got a wife and three kids, let me tell you something. It's no day at the, the picnic park. you got to work. you got to work to feed your family, and you got to take care of things around the house, and, and then you got to go to class, and then you got to do your homework. And, and he was telling me that in his three years at BBC, it was a three-year course back then, 500 freshmen quit and went home during his three years at BBC. 500 freshmen quit. When you struggle, it gives you some grit in your soul and a willingness to persevere. 
I, I read about a college kid who was living on the ease of Dad was sending him all the money that he needed, and so he wrote home one day. He wrote this. He was kind of a clever kid. He wrote, Dear Dad, no mun, short for money. Dear Dad, no mun, no fun, signed your son. <laughs> his dad finally realized what financing his kid's life had done to the kid. And so he wrote back, he said, Dear son, too bad, so sad, your dad. <laughs> If you're struggling tonight, it's not because God has abandoned you, all right? It's because he loves you, and he knows what's best for you. God knows what you need. He knows that if he reaches down and takes the scissors and cuts that hole open a little bit and lets you come out comfortably out of the situation, you're not going to be prepared for the next phase in life. He knows what you need. By the way, God knows what the future of your life holds, he, might, he, he knows that there might be a, an, an illness that you're going to have to fight through. He knows that you might lose a loved one and you're going to have to fight through that. He knows that there might be a financial crisis and he knows all of that. And he's just trying to prepare you for that struggle. How much does God mean to you tonight? Oh, I know the easy answer. Oh, I love the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart. Now I'm asking you to really search your heart. How much does God mean to you? How much does serving him mean to you? How much does pleasing him and glorifying him mean to you? Are those things important enough to you to struggle for? There are people in this room with very successful careers. You have worked and labored and crawled and scratched your way to where you are today. And I admire that so much. But if your occupation is worth that, isn't Jesus infinitely more worth that? He certainly is, isn't he, church? If what you are already doing for the Lord is easy for you, if it's comfortable for you, then you've plateaued in your growth and you need a struggle to grow more. Think about tonight as we go home. Think about how much Jesus struggled for you. Even now God is struggling for you. We know it was a struggle on Calvary, but even now God is struggling for you. He's fighting every day for your heart. Every day the Lord Jesus sits at the Father's right hand praying for you, pleading with God the Father on your behalf. He is struggling for you. He's fighting for you because he loves you that much. Oh, by the way, there's somebody else that's fighting for you too. His name is Satan. If Satan can struggle for you, then can't we struggle for Jesus? Satan is fighting every minute of every day for you. He wants to ruin you. He wants to ruin your family. He wants to ruin your marriage. He wants to ruin your kids. He's fighting hard for you. Your loyalty and your service to the Lord are up for grabs every moment of every day. And if you struggle today, you'll be stronger tomorrow because struggling strengthens. So the question is, are you ready to get uncomfortable? I hope so because in the months ahead, I'm going to present some information to you that's going to be a struggle. It's going to turn this church on its ear. You say, preacher, now you can't say that and quit and go home. Yeah, I can. That's what I'm going to do. So let's pray. Lord, thank you tonight. We can come together and read your word and open up the scriptures and let the Holy Spirit challenge us. Lord, I pray that you'd start with me.